Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's main meeting of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. This is the July edition, and we're pleased to uh, be able to host Anthony Nocentino, who is going to talk to us about containers. Anthony, That's who's also taking the time out of his schedule of uh, basking in Key West. We appreciate you <laughs> taking that time and take it away, please. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Um, it's been it's been a while. We're talking, it's been a while since I presented for a user group. Uh, so I'm, I'm super pumped to get back in there. So let me share my screen. Share screen one. Oh, wow. Let's get that over here. And let's get this in uh, view. So you see the deck, Kevin? Yes. Cool, rocking. All right. So um, this is containers. What next? What's next? I am Anthony Nocentino. I used to be a consultant and trainer and founder of Centino Systems. I am now a principal field solutions architect for Pure Storage. I hadn't updated the slide deck yet because updating slide decks is really hard from a template standpoint. Um, but still, my role hasn't changed. I specialize in system architecture and performance. I have several computer science degrees, and I've been fortunate enough to be a Microsoft Data Platform MVP for the last couple of years. It's probably how I met uh, Kevin initially, or at least through um, SQL Saturdays and whatnot. There's my contact information at the bottom. It's all still valid. I still have that email address, uh, even though I am a pure employee now. Uh, my Twitter handle, uh, I'm on Twitter pretty frequently, so please follow me on Twitter if you're not, because it's my main way to interact with our awesome data community. I'm still going to blog at that URL there. In fact, last week I hosted uh, T-SQL Tuesday, where we talked about containers. There's a whole slew of information I published last week, uh, and I summarized it over the weekend and uh, put the post on my blog there, so check that out. I, the main thing I asked people was, what are you doing with containers? And people shared like lots of ways that they're using containers in their either uh, database systems or in their application architectures uh, or even at home, like things like Pi-hole and things like that running in their home networks. If you don't know what Pi-hole is, just you can, I give you permission to leave the session right now and go look up what Pi-hole is. Uh, I'm also a Pluralsight author where I have tons of content on Linux, PowerShell, SQL Server on Linux, and also Kubernetes, which we will not talk about Kubernetes today. We're going to focus on containers themselves, specifically how to run SQL Server in containers. And if you haven't used a container before, that's cool. I have uh, an intro level talk available there on YouTube called Containers, You Better Get On Board. Perfect pun, right? Um, and that's kind of like the 101, like just getting you started in the container universe. But for today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. But don't worry, if you haven't used a container before, I'll still kind of walk you through um, how to get like what we're doing today, how to get that bootstrap. But the, we're going to focus on today is storing persistent data in containers. We're going to look at non-root containers, why you'd want to use a non-root container, and then how you use a non-root container when you want to create your own containers inside of, we're going to use Docker today. Um, and then we're going to look at how to build custom container images and enable certain features and configurations inside of a container image so I can have that pre-configured thing that I might want to put in my production environment or share with other developers. Like what are the features and things that I might need to turn on? Then we'll talk about the big one and I think is a, uh, a big idea behind how to use containers, especially in the data platform universe, is how to get data into your containers. You know, we still have these bits and bytes that are our databases. How do I get that database data accessible to a container? We'll talk about how data is stored, but that, in this uh, part here, we'll talk about how to get data into our containers so that we can use that. Then we'll dive a little deeply into container performance concepts and how it's different than what you might be used to seeing today. And so let's get into how containers store data. Oh, and I do want to point out, um, if you have questions throughout, just go ahead and um, get those over to Kevin and we can kind of like go through those throughout because I want to make this more of a interactive, or as interactive as possible uh, for the session. Cool. So let's talk about how containers store data. And so when we're talking about a container, it's going to be usually a single application. And that container is going to be the binaries and libraries that you need to run the application itself. And that thing is actually called a container image. Sometimes we use conflate the terms container image and container. But that thing that you download and run on your computer is a container image or the thing that you share with others or that thing that you pull from Docker Hub or later on that we're going to build together. <clears throat> 
Now, when you create a container, it's the container image, which is read only, and this thing called a writable layer. And so as data is changed inside of the container, it's written into the writable layer. And that is then presented back to your application with a single unified file system, right? So the container, the application running in the container doesn't know that the container image that it's based off of is read only. And if there's this writable layer under the hood, it's all unified together and exposed into your application. Now this is unique when you're working with containers because the writable layer itself has a life cycle of the container. So any data that's changed at this point in time that's been written into the writable layer, when I delete that container, that data is gonna go away as well. And so that when you're working with persistent state systems like databases is a really bad thing, right? We wanna be able to keep our data around independent of the life cycle of the container, right? I might need to stop it and start up a new container image, a new version. I might need to stop it and start it to perform maintenance on the system. And I don't want to have to destroy that underlying writable layer. And so let's get into how containers can store persistent data. And so kind of the same paradigm as we had before, when we start up a from a container image, it'll still create a writable layer, but what we'll do is we'll add a volume to the mix. And what a volume will do is be positioned at a particular location inside of the file system of the running container. And so we're gonna look at SQL Server containers today, and we're gonna put a volume at var opt MSSQL, which is the default data location for SQL Server on Linux, right? And so as I create data, or even as the um, uh, SQL Server itself creates log and whatever, that's gonna get written into var opt MSSQL. But what's gonna happen under the hood is the container runtime, in this case today, we're using Docker, will actually put some resources from the underlying file system of the real host that that container is running on at that file system location. So the container image thinks it's running or writing, reading or writing data from var opt MSSQL. But what it's actually doing is it's reading and writing it from the underlying storage device on the host. We still have a writable layer for all the other file system locations in the container where data is changing that aren't var opt MSSQL. And so what this gives us the ability to do is to delete that container still keep our data around and perhaps maybe upgrade and start a new container and then attach to that data or even just stop and start or reboot or whatever it is. But that volume and the data in that volume are completely independent of the life cycle of the container. That's kind of the core concept about how we're able to um, use containers to persist data independent of the life cycle. And this becomes really cool to see in practice because now what happens is we're kind of focused on the data not necessarily where it lives, not necessarily a server where that service lives, right? I just start up a container, attach that data, I can get access to that data, right? If it's a SQL Server container or whatever type of application container that it is that has data under the hood. And so this technique is used across all different types of persistent state systems. And so in today's session, what we're gonna focus on is Docker. Um, and so Docker is a container runtime that allows me to start containers on an underlying operating system. So on the right there, you can see I have a visual representation of several containers that have started up, SQL 1, SQL 2, SQL 3, all running and consuming the resources of the underlying host OS, right? And that host OS is just gonna be installed on any physical or virtual machine. And so what the container runtime will do is work with the host OS to expose resources from the host OS into the containers so that those containers can have access to things like CPU, RAM, and today, most important that we're gonna talk about is disk. And so Docker, the container runtime, exposes the underlying file system of the base operating system via a thing called Docker data volumes. And so generally you're gonna allocate storage from local storage from the host that the actual container is running on. So disks or SAN attached storage or whatever it is that's available for physical storage inside that host OS. Now, there are some scenarios where you can have remote storage, and we'll touch on those in a second. But on the right here, we see I have a Docker data volume named SQL Data 1, right? And that's a unique element independent of the lifecycle of the container that is attached into my container there of RFM SQL. And so SQL 1, anytime it reads and writes data, we'll write that into SQL Data 1. And I could have multiple data volumes attached to an individual container. And I can also have multiple data volumes attached to multiple containers. And we'll still see that in a few seconds here. So that remote storage scenario that I touched on a second ago is exposed via what are called volume plugins. And really, I don't see a lot of folks using volume plugins, but I wanted to just talk about it to let you know that if you go kind of see it out there, not a lot of folks are doing um, volume plugins for enabling remote storage scenarios, things like 
Azure Disks or Firewall Channel Storage or iSCSI, what I see most folks doing is just handling that at the base operating system level and then exposing it into container still as local storage because we'll just attach remote storage to the base OS and that'll be perceived as local storage inside the host operating system. So if it's remote, uh, you know, SAN storage or remote iSCSI, Fiber Channel, whatever it is, and then we expose that into our container as what it thinks is local storage in that base operating system. Now, what's cool about using Docker data volumes is you can pre-populate container or pre-populate content. And so I can have other volumes that are available and allocated from the base operating system that I can share amongst multiple containers. And so if I needed to have a Docker data volume that has a stack of backups in there that I would seed um, my containers with, well, I can do that. I can have a, you know, a bunch of test databases or whatever it is inside that backups volume there and attach that to you know, SQL one or two or three and then use that as sources for data into that container. I'll just put it at a different location inside of the file system. We're gonna do that in a second in our first demo. And so yeah, things like backups, uh, other database files. Um, my good friend, Andrew Prusky has a similar session like this. And so rather than seeding backups, he just attaches the database files, the MDFs and LDFs inside of the container. You can also have application code and scripts, and we're gonna do that in the second part of this talk today, where I'm gonna use some code to automatically restore a database inside of a container at startup. And so we can attach pretty much any file content into the container. These are the common things I'm seeing out there, backups, database files, and application code and scripts. So I have a link here uh, to docs.docker.com docs storage. If you wanna kind of dive into more detail about how to configure different types of storage. We're gonna focus on local storage today. So now that we kind of understand how uh, storage <coughs> is exposed into the container, we're gonna to shift to the next topic, non-root containers, and what, to understand why that is important and how that kind of ties together with files before we go on and start our first container today in today's session. So when SQL Server came out inside of a container, uh, I think is in 2017, about halfway through the releases of 2017, I think it was one of the later CUs, it might even be 2019, I think it was 2019, one of the later CUs. Uh, it, before that, it reached to run as root, which is really, really bad. You might be thinking, well, containers are isolated, and, you know, it's, but it's not necessarily a security boundary because it's gonna expose the underlying operating system to some security risks because when we're working with Docker, the commands that we execute are privileged, right? So if I do Docker run, that's going to execute as a root user. And so that's a very clear uh, attack factor for the esca escalation of breach on an individual host OS. But more practical in our scenarios, when we're working with data, <clears throat> is Linux uses user IDs and group IDs for permissions, right? And so if I have a process that's running inside of a container, let me bring it up over here. The process that's running inside of a container as root, it's going to run as UID zero, and UID zero is privileged on Linux. It's a, it's a representation of the root user, and so any time I run a process inside of a container that's UID zero, it can have potentially have access to the underlying OS and have access to any files in that inside of that OS. So that process running as root inside the container literally could attach to any file system location on the base operating system because those Docker commands are privileged. So if you give a developer pseudo access to just run Docker, you're literally giving them access to the entire base OS. Even if you limit that to the individual commands, just so they can run pseudo Docker, right? And so just kind of understanding why that's important is key to building secure applications. And so if I wanted to start a container and attach slash exe to uh, SQL 1 here, I can't. And I can go make system configuration changes if that container is running as user ID zero. And I can go and change or, you know, pretty much anything with the configuration of the operating system or any data, right, that's available inside the OS. I could easily attack and take that data and do bad things with it on the base OS. So we don't want to run application containers as root. That's like super bad, right? And so what we want to do is for our SQL Server containers is we want to run them as a user MSSQL and in Today's session, what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to create a container that does that. The SQL Server container that you get from Microsoft now will only run, or will run as the user MS SQL by default. So you don't have to do anything. So yeah, so Microsoft images require no configuration. But 
when we build images, this is crucial because you'll need to do some task as root inside of the container. And then you're going to switch to MSSQL and clean up some permissions before you create your container image, publish that, right? It just goes for any container-based application, this whole concept of uh, running as a non-root user. And so that kind of brings us to this question. So I'm talking like, but why do we want to run as a non-root user and building our own images? And so let's kind of touch on that in a little more detail. It's like, why would I want to build my own container image? Well, the idea is I can build once and deploy many, right? I've worked a lot of time for a long time in automation in the Windows space, especially around SQL Server. Super duper love DDA tools. I had a short, you know, frolic in the spring with DSC, PowerShell DSC a few years ago. And I learned to not love that anymore. But the idea is we want to be able to build repeatable systems in code so that we can deploy SQL instances. I did it with DSC and I did it with DBA tools and nothing will be as faster as fast as building a container image and deploying that. And that's one of the main reason why we want to do that. Customization. And so we'll see today is that I can assert customization inside of the container image to build that so that there's standardization across my environment, right? I want to have some control over what the container images look like when I deploy, right? So I don't want to just pull Microsoft container image and use the stock config. I can go ahead and build my container image the exact knobs and buttons and instance configurations and um, you know trace flags, all that stuff that I want baked into the image so that when I deploy that, everything looks the same. Obviously some configurations will vary based on your platform, but we kind of all understand that generally speaking, we want to have our instances be very similar from a uh, configuration standpoint, at least at some level, right? And also security. In, in the end, when you are running a container image, you're running someone else's built thing inside your data center. So you, you know, you do Docker run, yada, yada, yada. You're downloading someone else's code and you're trusting that that is patched, uh, hasn't been compromised, and is going to be the thing that you think it was that the publisher of that container image put into their container registry. And so in high security environments, they don't even allow access to public uh, container registries. And so the idea is you have to either syndicate that, that stuff down, uh, locally, so rather than having it on the internet, or even go as far as to build all of your own container images. And so security becomes a huge conversation there. Uh, if you do wanna dive into the security aspects of containerization, uh, Liz Rice has a fantastic book called Container Security. It is the gold standard for um, understanding the security principles of running applications inside of containers. I strongly recommend that book. So let's talk about uh, applying um, container build concepts to SQL Server. Like what does it look like when I build a custom container image inside or for SQL Server? And so we're going to look at this from a process standpoint now. And then when we jump into the demos, I'll walk you through the code so that you can see how it actually works. And so the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is set up the environment. And then the next thing that we'll do is actually install SQL Server with app get install SQL Server. We'll go through all that code. Then we'll configure the SQL Server. So anything we wanna to do to the SQL instance, we'll do that at that point in time after we've installed SQL Server, and then we'll build the container image. And so let's kind of look at each one of these phases in a little more detail. And so in set up the environment, what we'll do is we'll do things like add users, right? We already talked about how we're not gonna run the container as a root user, we're gonna run it as the user MSSQL. So we have to make sure that that's inside the container. We'll add any repositories that we need to install any applications that we want. And so we're gonna install SQL Server from the Microsoft repositories. And so we need to add those package repositories to our container image. We'll then install MSSQL Server. In today's example, we'll install MSSQL tools and then any other additional packages that you need to run for your, for your workload that you wanna put into your container image. Then once we have SQL Server installed, we can assert some configuration upon SQL Server in two ways, uh, via a tool called MSSQL Conf, which allows you to do things like set up TLS or enable a trace flag, set default database paths, so things like that. And so anything that was exposed via the Windows uh, SQL Server Configuration Manager should be exposed via MSSQL Conf. There's just not a, a, there's not a tool, like you, know, you can't use SQL Server Configuration Manager, the GUI against a SQL Server on Linux container. You'll use MSSQL conf to do that. You can also use environment variables to inject configuration dynamically. Uh, it's a fantastic way to kind of decouple some configuration from the actual build. And so if you have a particular configuration element that you know might be variable in your environment, this is a good way to inject that configuration. 
Then what we'll do is we'll build the container image and we can store that image local. And that's what we're gonna do in today's demos. Or we could push that container image to a repository, whether it be Docker Hub or an internal container registry or something even available in the cloud like Azure Container Registry. And so you can push that to a container registry so that others can share that same container image. And so if you're building maybe like a CICD pipeline or even a production environment, you're gonna to wanna to have your images available in kind of shareable location via the container registry. So MSSQL Conf, I kind of touched on it in pretty good detail. Uh, it's pretty much anything that you can configure in SQL Server Configuration Manager. But what is that, right? What are those things that are available? If you check out that link there, that's kind of the full listing of the configuration points for MSSQL Conf. And this here is a link to a full listing of all the environment variables that you can use to inject config into your uh, container image. Which one do you use? If it's a super static configuration, go with MSSQL Conf. If it's a variable in your environment, environment variables are the way to go. Cool. So let's do that. Let's do the stuff that we just kind of walked through. We're going to look at some persistent state stuff. We're going to look at a Docker file. We're going to create a custom container image and we're going to configure SQL Server and then deploy it from that custom container image. So as you're getting that cool. set up, a couple of questions have come in. Cool. Um, Love I believe the, the first official question was WTF. I didn't even know that you could do this as in SQL Server in a container. Which <laughs> okay. technically is a question, <laughs> um, but you know, kind of kind of comes into: um, Would you want to do this? Would you want to run SQL Server in a container, or why would you? And then I'll ask a follow up question. So the biggest thing for me um, that I've seen: No one's running SQL Server in containers in production that I know. Most folks are doing. CSUD pipelines, testing builds, um, testing out applications. Developers are using it to very quickly spin up a SQL instance for their own needs. So, for example, if you need a development SQL server, that's a, a help. That's a help desk ticket that gets kicked to the server team that creates a virtual machine that gets SQL server installed, and eventually, two weeks later, you get your SQL server back, so you can do your development. But imagine you're going to see in a second, I can run. SQL Server in a container, and this is a more advanced configuration, but in five lines of code, and I will be running in about 10 seconds, right? Um, that's kind of the number one reason. The, the other thing that we're seeing outside of what I described right there is SQL Server running in containers has become the foundation of a whole slew of platforms that Microsoft's been developing. So the SQL Server big data cluster is based all of containers and Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator um, that is, enables you to start multiple containers in a controlled way, right? So um, we also have Azure Arc enabled data services of which I am a co-author of a book. So Azure Arc enabled data services gives you the ability to run uh, Azure PaaS services like manage instance on-prem or even in another cloud in GCP or AWS. And all the underpinning technology underneath that is containers. And so this is the journey, right? Microsoft put SQL Server on Linux, Microsoft put SQL uh, Server in a container, they put SQL Server in Kubernetes, and then they started building other products on top of that, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and that was my follow-up question around um, would you use this in production and possibly why you might use it? And my answer was basically uh, big data cluster, sure, but otherwise probably yeah. not. Um, looks like there's a little oddity around what we're seeing. I'm seeing uh, like the demo uh, keynote slide and then just a few pieces of uh, Azure Data Studio there. I wonder if it means stop sharing and reshare. Yeah, I see it, I see it too. Stop share. Um, and to kind of go to that point with of like, n no one is going to rip and replace their production windows, SQL servers, and drop in containers, right? We can, I can, we can barely, I can barely, like when I did consulting up until two weeks ago, I could barely get customers to move from 2012 to 14, 16 to 19, right? Let alone like change the underlying platform. Um, but what I am seeing is folks using them for development. And as they start th rethinking how their full application architectures look like, they now know if like, if they want to build a microservices application on Kubernetes, well, I can also build my data platform on that. And the value of that in a large organization, especially um, to a CIO or, or to a director is 
I now have a uniform platform to run my application. I don't have to have a Windows platform team or a Linux platform team. I can have a single platform team that runs everything, right? And that's a lot of value to some organizations. So do you see the uh, VS Code not coming? Yeah, it's looking a lot better. Cool. Okay, so what I have here on my, on my laptop, I'm on a Mac, um, but I actually am not running this demo inside of a Mac because we're going to do slightly more advanced stuff um, than I would, than I need from what's available to me in, in Docker Desktop for Mac. And so I have an Ubuntu system with regular uh, community Docker installed, uh, creatively named Docker Zero. And what we're going to do first is build a container image. And so what we're going to do in this container image is we're going to install SQL Server, and then we're going to be able to instantiate multiple copies of this container to run multiple um, instances of SQL Server on this operating system here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build our container based off of the Ubuntu 18.04 container. And so what will happen here when I run Docker build is I'll execute these commands in this Docker file in this sequence. And so the first thing it'll do is it'll pull down the Ubuntu 18.04 image and then start an intermediate container image from that, or intermediate container from that, and then execute these commands, and then basically stamp that container image as finished when I'm done, and then I can start up a container from it. And so from that, so I have an Ubuntu, basically an Ubuntu operating system now, I run a command, and this is just a regular old Linux command. So I just say run, which is a Docker keyword, but I'm gonna say run the Linux command, user add minus U, and specify a user ID, so that my MSSQL user that this command creates always has that ID. Let's, and then after we do that, I'm going to install some required packages. So we're just using app get, update, install, and then we'll go and get the configuration for the various Microsoft repositories that I need. I'm not going to go through the gory detail of how to add a repository. This code, I think, still works. I'm just kidding, I ran it a few minutes ago. Um, but what this code here does is it installs all those repositories and then at the bottom here, you can see app get update, which will update the package metadata of what is <clears throat> exposed by those three repos. And then once it's done, it'll do app get install SQL Server, SQL Tools, and Unix ODBC. Right. And so in a few minutes later, I'll have an installed version of SQL Server. I then have some additional code that's going to clean up some file system caches because we want to keep our container images um, lean and neat. Because when I talk about being able to share containers, and exchange those, the smaller they are, the more quickly I can do that. And it actually becomes, uh, let's see, um, a pretty key concept of running containers in production. It sounds trivial, like I, keeping my container much small, but we can kind of get into the weeds about that later. Um, let's see, then I'm gonna make a directory. So there we talked about how far opt MSSQL is where SQL Server keeps its data. So I wanna make sure that directory is there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that the user that we just added has permissions to or is the owner of that directory and so that when this process starts up as the mssql user it's able to create files and create folders inside var op mssql now here's just a quick example of how to configure sql server we're going to do mssql conf and so literally it's a command that has parameters and those parameters like from the documentation link i had in the presentation portion i can use that to kind of build a more advanced configuration so in this case here i'm just saying MSSQL conf set SQL agent enabled true. And then I'm going to run this command. I didn't talk about this yet, but what I'm doing here is I'm kind of bringing two commands together to execute in one, one build step. Um, it's a little bit more of an advanced topic inside of building container images, but you want to kind of bundle like things together uh, because of the way the efficiencies that you can have on um, how the image is laid out physically. Uh, We'll maybe I'll make a third presentation and go into those details. The next command that I have is MSSQL conf trace flag 336. And so every SQL Server instance that I start from this container image that we're about to build will have those configuration elements. Pretty practical ones, right? Enabling the agent and uh, disabling the logging of successful backups. Then they have the uh, application inside the container. It's going to be listening on port 1433. Now, every command before this line right here ran as the root user because we did some privileged stuff. We installed repositories, we installed packages, we made configuration changes. But now is the time we want to switch to run the rest of the code in this container image as a non-privileged user. And so that is what this command does is it switches the control from 
root to MSSQL, which we added a few minutes ago at the top. And then the command that we're going to run is opt MSSQL bin SQL service. That's the SQL server process. Remember, we've talked about all the container is, is the application itself and the binaries and libraries to support that. And so we're just going to run a SQL server process. And so with that, that's a Docker file. We type Docker build, we give it, we tag the image, which is effectively a name uh, and how to uniquely identify a particular container image. So this one's gonna be SQL demo one. And this is called a build context. And what the build context simply does, it says look in this directory for the Docker file. And so that's all that's doing there is looking for in the local directory. So let's run that code to build that image. Hey, it looks like uh, we're having some issues with screen refresh again. So what we're going to do here is build an image from this Docker file, right? And so we talked about, you've heard me talk about from the Ubuntu image, right? We're going to add a user. And so these commands here are going to be executed inside the container image during the build process. And then we're going to install some additional packages that are required to get the container image built. And then we are going to install the Microsoft repositories where the software is that we want to install. And then in this line of code here, we can see that we have app get install MSSQL server, MSSQL tools, Unix or DBC dev. And so all that we're doing so far is we've added a user, we've um, updated our app package metadata, we installed a couple of repos, and then we installed the software onto the container image or going to build. Then we have this command here to clean up any package metadata because we don't want that to be part of the container image. And I touched on why that's important a few seconds ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have a command to make var up SQL and set the ownership of that directory because we're going to run this container as a non-root user. So they receive the user MSSQL and the group MSSQL will have ownership of var up MSSQL. So here's those two commands that I mentioned a minute ago that I'm using to set uh, some configuration inside the container image. So MSSQL conf is going to set SQL agent to true and MSSQL conf trace flag is gonna, uh, be, we're gonna set 3226 on. And so the parameters for this command you can get from the documentation link that I referenced in the presentation. We're gonna listen on port 1433. And at this point in time, all the commands before this point in time executed as root. We're gonna switch the user to MSSQL and then any subsequent command will get run as MSSQL. And the only one that's gonna be is starting up our actual SQL server. And so when I do a Docker build, it's going to execute all of these commands and then create a container image. And then later on, when I do a Docker run, this is the program that actually gets started up. So let's jump back over to this file. Yep, looks like it's updated. I now I have the presentation in my, on my other monitor, Kevin, so I can kind of keep up with what you guys are seeing. Cool. And, and so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's coming through uh, nice and clear right now. Cool. So I built this container image before today's talk because it you know it takes a few minutes to do all this stuff. But we see at the bottom here is each build step getting executed, right? We see from Ubuntu, we see run user add, we see run app get update, and then all the other commands that and um all the other commands that are executed inside of the container, their user, and then 10 of 10 setting the command as opt MSSQL bin SQL server. There is successfully built and then it tags it. So it gives it a name. And so from there, I can actually instantiate a container from that container image that we built together. I could push that to a repo and share it with you. I could push that to a repo and start up, you know, 10 of those containers anywhere I have a container runtime. And so to do that, to start up a container, we use the command Docker to run. I'm going to inject some configuration that's required with environment variables, except EULA and then the MSSQL password. I'm going to give the container a name and we're going to attach a volume. And so this is the code where we say, you know what, create a volume named SQL data one from the base operating system and attach that into the container of our op MSSQL. I'm going to publish access to this container on port 31433. So that's where it will send user traffic to go inside the container and talk to the application in the container on 1433. We're going to detach from the console. So when you do Docker run, it'll background the task and give me the console back. And that's the name of the container image that I want to start. And so there we go. We have a running SQL Server instance. I can check to see if it's running by doing a Docker PS. So Docker PS, I have the unique container ID from the image. We see the command to start up the container. 
It's created six seconds ago. It's been up five seconds. Ports listening on all IPs, so 0.0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 .0 on 31433 and forwarding inside the container on 1433 SQL demo one. So I can send user traffic from anywhere that can reach my, the IP address of the system to that port and I'll get access to that SQL instance. And so let's do that with SQL CMD. I'm gonna send it to localhost because you know my IP changes wherever I am uh, on port 31433. And I'm just gonna say, you know what, SQL Server, give me your name. And I run that code and we can see that the host name of the, of the system or the server name variable inside the container matches the ID of the container. So 0624, 0624. And if I do add at version, you can see I'm running SQL Server 2019 CU10. Pretty cool. If I go, if I use, I can use Docker exec to launch a shell inside the container. So I'm, I'm running as the user MSSQL. Let's make that one night bigger. I'm running as the user MSSQL. Uh, and there's the host name ending in 062. Put it down a little bit. And if I do and now I'm inside the container, if I do a process listing inside the container, you can see that my SQL server is running as the user MSSQL. Right? It's a non-root container, so super important there. Now any of those MSSQL conf commands that we executed actually create a configuration file in this directory called MSSQL comp. And so if I look inside there, we'll see uh, kind of an INI like um, file that has the configurations of the container. So SQL agent enabled equals true, trace flag zero, you know, trace flag one, two, three, four for the multiple trace flags equals three, two, two, six. And so if you wanted to, you could actually take this file and make that part of your container build image and copy it in as another way to make sure you have a standardized configuration. If I check my environment variables, we can see the environment variables that are set. A couple are at runtime, except you equals yes, and MSSQL SA password, and there's my SA password there. But if I had other configuration parameters that I wanted to configure, they'd be available here for the processes running inside the container to access. If I look at var opt MSSQL, you can see kind of the layout of the instance. So there's data for databases, log for the application logs of the SQL Server instance. MSSQL conf, and then some secrets are hidden in there. If I look inside of data, there we can see the actual databases associated with the instance. So there's master, this log, with the log, log file, model, MSDB, tempdb, and so on. <clears throat> now, if I exit out of the container, I'm back onto my base OS, which is that Docker zero. And so when we go inside the container, we can look around and see what the container sees as the running container image as the user MSSQL. Now, we talked about where data lives, right, inside of a uh, container. And we decoupled those two things because we attached the volume named SQL Data 1 to the container that um, our SQL Server instance is running as. And so if I do Docker volume inspect SQL Data 1, it'll tell you where that data really is on the base OS. We mounted SQL Data 1 at var opt MSSQL. We saw that data inside the container. But where it physically lives is here, var lib docker volumes SQL data one. That's the default data location here. That's this one here is the default data location of a docker volume. I could specify a file system path if I wanted to. If I go inside of there, I see that I have the data that we saw, right, for var auth MSSQL. And if I go one level deeper, there we see the databases again. So they physically live here on my base OS but Docker thinks, if Docker exposes them to SQL Server inside the container at bar off MSSQL. So now, let's see, if I do a Docker RM, that's gonna remove the container, right? My data is still there until I remove the volume. So Docker volume RM, SQL data one, at this point in time, it'll go and it'll clean up that data and it won't be in that location anymore in var lib Docker volumes. And so we've decoupled those things. And so now if I come along, if CU11 comes out and I want to test that, I can have that data already at um, in that SQL data one volume that I can reuse over and over again and instantiate new containers and attach that data if I want to. Oh, darn it, I did the Zuni thing, Kevin. Uh-oh. All right, it looks like we're good. Yeah, it's still looking okay. Yeah, it's the mouse gestures. I just, you know, it's like a like a reflex on how I switch uh -huh. between applications, right? Cool. All right. So, any questions around building container images? Why it's important to run 
as root injecting configuration Docker files? Anybody, anything out there? So there is one question, and it was related kind of to, um, well, the fact that Docker for a while defaulted to root for containers. Um, mm. Are you familiar with Podman? Not directly. I conceptually know um, what it is. So maybe I can answer. I don't know. Okay. It was basically, what are your thoughts on Podman or other Docker replacements? Sure. Um, everything that I've done has been um, in the Docker universe. And primarily, I've been, I've been spending a lot of my time in the Kubernetes space. And um, Kubernetes has switched, shifted away from Docker as a container runtime. Um, Docker itself runs container D under the hood. Um, so you kind of think, I don't, I don't want to conflate the terms, but container D is the thing that actually creates the container. Docker is just tooling to create containers, right? And run containers. Um, so even if you run Docker, I can show you this right now. And I go to here and I do a, um, this is on the base OS. Let's see. It's totally a tangent, but this is why I love user groups, right? Um, so Docker itself is actually talks to container D. So if I do Docker run, Docker run actually goes and says, you know what, container D startup container. And Kubernetes is doing that directly. They just get rid of the Docker layer and say, just start up container. Um, now, so that's kind of like starting to break away that kind of privilege escalation thing, like kind of break these things into their atomic parts. You're still going to use Docker to build images. You're still going to use, uh, I think it's build uh, to build images on, on the Red Hat side of the house. And that's kind of the line of demarcation. Um, Podman is going to be based off of most of the Red Hat OSs. Um, and then the, the communities that I've operated in are, fun, are predominantly going to be our Ubuntu-based communities. And so I haven't really had an opportunity to mess with um, Podman directly. But in the end, it's a container runtime. You create container images with Builda. And so it's kind of the analogous thing to using Docker to create container images in Kubernetes. And then OpenShift is the analog in the Red Hat world to run as a container orchestrator for the images that, or the containers that you run inside of um, rel based OSs. That was a long answer, but I think I covered it. <laughs> um, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, it's that's a, the thing. Like the the the, the container space, it's, there's so many tools and it's changing so rapidly. It's it's super hard to keep up. But I guess that's why we have Twitter and blogs. Um, any other questions, sir? Looks like nothing at the moment. Cool. I'm like way in the red zone on time. So if you, if we if anyone has to bump uh, the bottom of the hour, um, feel free. But I'm gonna if you want me to kind of you want me to speed up, Kevin, you want to just kind of finish in, at normal pace. No, go at your pace. We're we're not in a hurry. Yeah, that's why I love user groups because it's a little more free form, you know. Cool. So what we have so far is we have a good container image built on good secure principles, right? We saw non-root, you know, we have, we're able to decouple data, to persist data outside of the container, independent of the life cycle, but now I'm going to extend that, right? So let's say, you know, I'm in charge of building a CI, CIC pipeline for my org. I have this custom image now, but now I need to get data into that custom image so I can run my tests, right? That's kind of the scenario. And so like, I ask you this question, um, if I build the container image, would I want to put the database data inside the container image? Like, what are some of the pros and cons behind doing that? A pro, it's there. Con is it's part of the size of the image, right? So if I have a one terabyte database and I put it inside my container image and I do Docker build. Well, that's going to create a one terabyte container image, which is bananas and actually doesn't work. And we'll talk about, I can talk about why. Um, but effectively, remember that process of when we change stuff inside the container image. On container startup, the stuff that's in the container image will get copied out to the writable layer, copy on write. So if you have a, this is an extreme example, but if I have a one terabyte database, if I just online that database, I've made a change to that database by just onlining it, it's then going to copy one terabyte out to the writable layer, right? And it's going to blow up. It's actually not going to work. SQL Server gets cranky because it took too long. Ask me how I know. And so that um, isn't really how you're going to want to do it. You're going to want to decouple 
the databases from the containers themselves. And so we can do a couple of ways. I talked about using restores and attaching. Andrew, my friend, uh, has some demos built around attaching. And we, I'm going to show you some restores today. We're going to do it both manually and automatically. What I mean is I can manually restore the data, like literally do restore database, yada, yada, yada. Or automatically, I can, when the container starts up, tell that process to run a script that goes and looks in a location for the data that I want to restore. Right? So I can just put a stack of backups in a directory and say, restore those backups or run those database scripts right? that create the databases. Today, we're going to focus on um, restores. So yeah, but the key thing is the databases with the backups need to be available to the SQL Server inside the container. So remember earlier on in the presentation, I had slash backups, right? Well, I could expose that as a volume and then just have that data available to be inside the container. And so I can go ahead and start working with that data, right? And so there could be databases in there or backups or whatever it is. And they could be local or remote on the actual host itself or on remote storage, as we talked about. And this gives us the ability to seed larger databases in containers without having that weight be part of the container. And so it's going to look something like this. You know, I have my container up and running. I attach a Docker data volume to it to persist data. And then I have my stack of backups that I have available to me inside of a container. And then I can start up multiple containers. But then I can also still access those backups. I can share that resource. I can't share SQL Server data because it locks, you know, MDS and LDS unless they're locked files and they're protected. And that's just not the kind of paradigm that SQL Server works with in sharing databases. But I can do that with backup files or database scripts to create or, and, or data files to attach singularly, right, to one instance. So now, how would I do this automatically, right? We saw a few minutes ago at the bottom of my Docker file, I had a command CMD, right? That's the thing, the command that gets launched when the container starts, right? And so what I could do is rather than call SQL Server, I can call a script. And what that script's gonna do is it's gonna loop using SQL CMD to test if my SQL Server is online. So when I do Docker run, even in a container image not using this system, it takes like five or 10 seconds for SQL Server to start up and become available for remote connections. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna loop right here and say, are you online? Are you online? Are you online? Oh, you're online, cool. Now execute the script to either restore or attach to the databases. And what that's gonna do is give me kind of that control to say, you know what, wait, 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 now restore. And it's more deterministic than using the sleep. Like if I use a sleep, you know, how long do I sleep for? I don't know, it's gonna be dependent on the system. And so this technique kind of breaks me from that uh, potentially troubling way of using a sleep test of the SQL Server's online. And so let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and restore some databases inside of containers automatically. Don't use the gesture, Anthony. I'm gonna tab over, there we go. All right, cool. So for this demo, let's jump over. I have a very similar Docker file here, okay? From, we saw that earlier, user add, all the same stuff. We're gonna build a second image, and then but the key difference is gonna be at the bottom. So here, all the same stuff that we saw, configure SQL Server. What we're gonna do here is I'm gonna copy some scripts into the container from the current working directory scripts into the slash slips scripts directory. I'm going to mark one of those as executable with the chmod plus x, configure db.sh, expose SQL Server, switch SQL Server to the user MSSQL. And then what I want to do is execute the command, configure SQL Server, and run the SQL Server process. And so it's going to start both of those processes up. The script that's going to check to see if my SQL Server is available and then execute the restore. And then my um, start up my SQL instance. Cool. So let's look at that script code. Let's see that's over here. So all we have here is, well, I have a sleep in there, don't tell anybody. I, I totally bad not sleep a few minutes ago and forgot that I had that in there. But what I do have below that is the loop that says, you know what, for a minute, go and test to see if the instance is there. And all it's doing is select one from sys.databases. And if it gets a valid value back, like a non-zero exit code, or excuse me, if it gets a zero exit code, then it breaks from the loop and then the control flow pops down and executes the restore. If the instance isn't online, it just sleeps for a second and then loops again until I get a zero exit code from SQL CMD and then it breaks 
and it executes the restore. And all the restore down here is, is the SQL CMD to call a script in slash scripts, which is uh, restore test db once. Just inside that file is just the restore gymnastics to restore a backup from slash backup test db one, right? So that's going to be a volume that we attach. And so that's the flow is when I start the container up, it calls configure db, configure db runs the loop. Once the instance is available, it executes the restore against the database files that are available in slash backup. So let's do this. The first way that we're going to do it, this is, I believe, manually. Yeah, we're going to first one to do manually. And the second one, we're going to use that automated technique. So let me pull this down a little bit. So here we have a Docker run again. We're going to have some environment variables and a name. We're going to publish our port. We're going to attach a data volume. So nothing different than we saw before, just a different name. And then I'm going to attach another volume, which is a local path in the base OS that has a stack of backups in it. So if I do an ls dot dot backups, all that's in there is a couple backups, right? So let's go ahead and run that container. I have var optimus SQL data as a volume for to persist my data independent of lifecycle. Then I have slash backup. So I'm going to jump down here. I have some commented code out here. Because you'll see a lot of demos where people will do this. They'll do Docker CP, and I'm going to copy my backup into the container, and then I'm going to change the permissions on that, and then I'm going to restore my database. The challenge with that, I think, is if what if test db1 is a terabyte, right? Then I have to have a terabyte to land that backup inside of the container, which I might not have available to me. And so that's not a very inefficient, not a very efficient use of that space, right? Well, one, it takes time, and two, it takes space, right? Time, space. And so what we're going to do is take those backups that are on my local base OS and expose them with the volume, which we saw. And then if I go inside the container, if I do a Docker exec minus IT, and just get a directory listing on slash backup here, we'll see that the stuff in the base OS is literally the same stuff that's available inside the container. And so that way I have access to that stuff on the base OS and I can come along and I can restore my database. Right. And so this is a way for me to get that data in there without having to copy the multiple, potentially multiple terabytes of data around. And so what, so what we're doing here, SQL CMD, we're going to call that same restore script on this container. And at the bottom here, we can see restore database successful. So that's a manual way of doing that same thing. But the idea is don't move the data, bring the container to where the data is and just start it there. And you can get the data onto that host in any numerous ways, snapshots, you know, you just have an expanded disk. Whatever it is, however you need to move backups around. So yeah, let's see if that database is there. And we can see test db1 is there. And this is just select name for sys.databases. So let's get rid of that. We're going to do docker rm minus f on the current container. We're going to remove the volume. And now we're going to build the Docker file that we walked through a few seconds ago, just to make sure that that's built. And it is. So I just did a docker build minus t. SQL demo two, we're in a different directory here. So the build context is this Docker file in the demo two directory. And so now if I do the same thing, same exact code that I ran a second ago, just updated a couple parameters to give it a unique name. So 2B, 2B, and we're attaching the backup directory again. If I jump down and I do Docker logs, SQL demo two minus minus follow, what that's gonna do is tail the log, the error log of the SQL server, which is written to standard out. We can see, after a few seconds, it said SQL Server ready, right? That's when the loop was running. And it was like, boom, SQL Server is ready. It writes to output restoring database, which is what we saw here in the script, restoring database. And then it goes and restores the database. And that happened automatically, right? I didn't have to do anything. I just started with a container. And that container looks and runs those scripts and then kicks that off and goes. And once the SQL Server starts, executes that script as we described. Let's break out of here, get a listing of databases. There's test db1. And that happened automatically on this unique container. And now that doesn't have to be something as, um, as uh, let's see what I'm looking for. I don't have to point it to exactly one backup. What if it was, I had DBA tools and PowerShell installed and I just pointed it to a, a directory location and it just snorkeled up all those backups and restored them as DBA tools would so perfectly do. And so that's a way to be able to kind of build, you know, more advanced automations that are more dynamic. I can say attach this volume and then run some scripts to just dynamically see what's available to me and start restoring that stuff. We could totally do things like that.
So if I go inside the container again, so Docker exec minus IT, SQL demo two bin bash, if I look at slash backup, there's the backups. If I look at slash scripts, there's those scripts. And then we, just to show you that it's still running as on root, we have that available here. Cool. All right, so let's clean up from that demo. We're gonna remove that container and remove that volume and jump back into the third part of the session. How are we doing, Kevin? Good questions, anything? Uh, yeah, there was one question. The SQL data one mm -hmm. that you showed, uh, that was an AWS EBS volume, yeah? No, those are local volumes. So we did Docker, actually, I don't, I don't have it up here anymore. Um, this is all running locally on an Ubuntu instance of Docker volume ls. See, let me go here. It can be actually, you can have remote volumes. It'd be There's like Azure disk and EBS if you wanted to. If I do a Docker volume ls, after creating it, you'll see the driver is local. Um, there's different types of drivers. The drivers are what can enable different underlying storage subsystems. Um, and then, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yep, you bet. Okay, don't use gestures again. All right, so we are officially in the red zone. Uh, to use the sports metaphor, because um, we are past our, or in overtime, I should say. But we'll keep going. So now that we know um, kind of how to uh, build and package our data, well, what about running containers? Like what are the performance things that I need to be concerned about? And the interesting thing is with SQL Server and Linux, there's no concept of running um, a named instance, right? And so SQL Server and Linux, the way that you run, kind of get that same functionality of being able to run multiple instances on a single host is via containers. And so what we're gonna talk about now, you know, from a developer standpoint, that's probably something I'm gonna do is run two or three or four maybe uh, different versions of SQL Server to test things out, right? And so we can't get named instances in SQL Server and Linux, but containers will provide similar functionality. So we're gonna talk about what it takes to start up multiple instances of a container and then some of the performance considerations that I want to understand when I'm working with uh, multiple instances of containers running on a single host. So what we'll do is we'll deploy containers with unique names. You saw like SQL Demo 1, SQL Demo 2, they had unique names for the containers and then unique stores for the data, obviously. Like, right, you want SQL Data 1, SQL Data 2, and have those be separated out. We'll also want to have unique ports, which really is all named instances do under the scene, is they route you to a, a unique port on the base OS inside of Windows. And then you're going to be doing the same thing on Linux, except there's no thing routing that for you. You just have to remember the port. And so it's going to look like this. So on the base OS, uh, we'll have potentially multiple instances of SQL Server running in separate unique containers. And with the unique port here, we see 31443, 31444, 31445, right? And so those are three completely unique uh, SQL Server instances running in different containers on unique ports with unique storage. And so that's the way for me to be able to get that same functionality. Now, when you do this, though, resource management is your responsibility in windows you know there's some finer things that are happening inside of sql os and when the windows os to kind of keep things kind of in balance i mean if you're running a high performance workload you're probably not running named instance to begin with but sql server can kind of forgive the, you know one instance taking more memory and then giving it back to the other dynamic memory management stuff like that and it can do that but you don't have that available to you inside of containers right? Because resource management becomes your responsibility. We're going to talk more about why that's the case. Now, it's going to get a little bit into the internals of how containers really work and consume the resources of the base OS. And so that's what a container really is providing is it's providing an abstraction to the resources of the underlying operating system, not even the hardware, like virtual machines abstracted hardware, right? Containers abstract the operating system and give you the ability to consume, you know, memory, uh, processes or CPU and, and disk, uh, just like we've observed throughout today's session. And so the Docker though, is the thing that gets me the ability to create a container. Fundamentally it's container D under the hood, but Docker is the tooling to create these things. And so I have the ability to get some control around the resources. And the way that that happens on Linux systems is with a thing called C groups or control groups. 
And that's a, a mechanism inside the Linux kernel that can give me the ability to put resource controls around some of the critical uh, system attributes in a system, so CPU, disk, RAM, network, process IDs, and things like that. And Docker then gets us the ability to control access via C groups. And so I can use Docker tooling to say, you know what? I want to control access for this container so that I can only have access to one CPU or four gigs of RAM or you know, uh, 10,000 IOs per second or some whatever that value is. And maybe even limit the number of process IDs that can run inside of a container. And so Docker works with C groups to control that access so that you can administratively kind of subdivide the resources of your base OS. And what's cool is it's adjustable at the creation. So if I come along and see a, you know, CPU going crazy in one of these containers, I can come back and say, you know what? You can only have access to one core now or, or some metric. You can only have access to three cores or you know, whatever that value is inside to control that workload based on the available resources in the base OS, which is really cool. Uh, there's a link to a deep dive on that if you want to get into resource constraints inside of containers. And so let's kind of look at how we can control CPU specifically. We're going to start with that and how it's unique to SQL Server. So there's a couple of different ways I can expose or uh, control access to the underlying uh, CPU of a system. I can use CPU sets, I can use limits, and I can use shares. And CPU sets are going to limit access to specific CPUs of the base OS. So I can say, you know what, SQL 1, you have access to cores 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 or 1 and 6, or whatever the combination is that I want to have. Limits, I can say, you know what, you have access to at most two cores. I don't care which two cores, but at most two cores, or at most one core. And the scheduler is going to influence that. The, um, the system with the application running in there will still see all of the CPUs, but the scheduler is what's going to control access to those in both limits and CPU sets, and how it's going to put the workload onto the actual processors in the system. Uh, shares are basically limits that only kick in when CPU is constrained. Now, SQL Server, when I run a SQL Server, let's say my base OS had six cores. If I start up a SQL Server and say you have access to cores zero and six, from zero and five uh, in a six core system, it, SQL Server will see all of the cores, but the scheduler will only put its workload on zero and five, right? And so that is a little trippy when you start that the first time, you're like, hmm, why does it see all the cores? Clearly, there's something wrong with the command that I just executed and say you have only access to two, right? And so that can um, kind of be that tough barrier to get over uh, when you first start working with this tech. Limits, same thing. If I say, you know what, you have access to two cores, doesn't matter which is two cores, but you can have access to only the two cores of the six, the scheduler is going to influence that workload. Now, memory limits will limit access to an actual range of memory. If I don't set memory limit when I start a container, the container will see all of the memory in the base OS, which is bad in a sense. If I run three SQL Server containers and they all see the memory of the base OS, they're all going to try to consume that and fill that up with their buffer pools. And then we're going to have potentially have out of memory scenarios and containers will start getting killed because there literally won't be enough memory to support the workload. Now, if when I do put a memory limit on, limit on there, if I say, you know what, SQL 1, you have access to 4 gigs, it will only see 4 gigs, and it actually doesn't expose that into the container. Now, SQL Server on Linux, due to its architecture, only exposes 80% of what is exposed to the process to the actual SQL Server. So if I say, you know, start up a container with 4 gigs of RAM, the container will have 4 gigs of RAM, but SQL Server, due to the architecture of SQL Server on Linux, and SQL Pal will only by default expose 80% of that or three gigabytes in that scenario. If I have a large memory system, that 80% number can get kind of out of control and waste some memory. It's a tutable parameter via MSSQL comp if you're in a large memory system. And so for some configuration best practices around that, check out that link there from Microsoft on SQL Server on Linux performance best practices. Cool. So let's dive into some monitoring concepts to kind of figure out like what we're looking at. If I have this, these limits, I need to be able to look at the data to say, you know, where do I look inside of Docker to figure out what's going on from my workload? Now, the first thing that you're going to want to do is stabilize the host name inside the container. And what I mean by that is if you saw way back in the first demo, add at server name, 
was the actual Docker ID. And that Docker uh, container ID has the life cycle of the container, which means if I delete that container and still have that master database and start a new container, it's going to get a new Docker ID for the container that's running, but the metadata inside of SQL Server is going to think it's the old file or the old container ID, right? And that's bad news because now your data doesn't match. And so what you can do is you can tell uh, Docker to stabilize the host name and I can inject some configuration that says, you know what, even though I said I started this container, use this value for the host name and then that's what's going to get used by SQL Server for add at server name. And so then I can use anything to monitor um, the instances that I want to use third party tools that monitor SQL Server and Linux, you can just use those like out of the box, no big deal. Um, you know, DMVs are available to you, but you don't have access to WinRM or DCOM, so you can't point perfmon at a uh, SQL Server and Linux instance. But you can have tooling uh, in your infrastructure that can talk to Linux systems, and that's going to be the way that you're going to want to use that to monitor a third party or using third party applications to monitor your SQL Server instances. DMVs will be exposed as normal. Now, today we're going to look at Docker stats, which is going to expose metrics by Docker. And so Docker has the ability to tell us who's consuming what. And we're going to see that in our upcoming demos. And of course, we, as I indicated a few seconds ago, you can monitor the base OS uh, as it's for any Linux system. And one of the other things that I like to just kind of bring up, and we're going to see this in the demos, is this idea of the restart parameter when you do Docker run. So Docker run has the ability to use this restart parameter to keep a container online. If you want to. So I have a couple parameters here of no. So if, if I do minus minus restart no, if the container um, throws a non-zero exit code, uh, it crashes, it won't do anything. If I reboot the system, it won't do anything. But that on failure parameter, if I say minus minus restart on failure, if I get a non-zero exit code from my application, Docker would just restart the container for me, which is pretty cool functionality. If it crashes, well, just restart it. Similarly, always is if it crashes, restart it, or if I reboot the system, restarted. And then unless stopped is the parameter. If I type Docker stop, then it'll gracefully shut down the container and won't restart it. If I have if I do Docker stop and I have always set, it will restart it. So that gives me some flexibility on how I can get my containers to restart independent of my underlying operating system. If I have to reboot my laptop or reboot the server that the stuff is running on, I can get some durability out of that if I want to. And so let's go ahead and dive into those demos where we we'll define uh, we're going to create some containers using limits. We're going to examine how SQL Server sees the hardware based on the limits that are associated with that. And then we're going to use Docker stats to perform some, or check out some perf data. So clean up some of these windows and get into that third demo. This is my super advanced workload. <laughs> if you want to see that, well, equals one equals one. Just bang out some check DBs, but you'll see it makes things get pretty hot. All right, there we go. We're in demo three, and what we're going to do first is run a container with no limits. And so we're just going to do a Docker run, all the same stuff that we've seen before, some environment variables and name. Here I have a host name, and so that's how I'm able to stabilize the hosting inside the container. All right, this name is just for the container. This host name is literally the host name inside of the container. And so when SQL Server starts up, it's going to read that and set that value and add at server name. And I have a restart and less stop set here. And so let's run, let's say Docker run, and start up that container. And if I do a Docker PS now, we can see that our container has been up for a few seconds. If I go too fast, oh, no, it's already up and online. And so there we see that instead of it being the container ID and then an EA4, it's actually SQL demo three. So if I point century one or if I point Redgate SQL monitor at this, I'll get valid data, right? Versus having a container ID that changes with the state of the running container itself. So now I have a query moving forward. Let's kind of examine how limits, the limits or the no limits that we've exposed and see how SQL Server sees the underlying infrastructure. And so I have a query here to query the CPU count to and memory in gigabytes six. So I have no limits. And so SQL Server will see all of the memory in the base OS. If I do a free minus M, the base OS has roughly eight gigs of memory in it. 80% of that is six gigs and I see all the cores. 
So that's just the nature of SQL Pal. The C6 out of eight gigs available or 80%. And I see all of the cores. And now the command Docker stats will give me another view of that. So let me see here. So the container ID, EA4, the name, the amount of CPU burn right now, the amount of memory used, and then the memory limit. Since there's no limit, it's all the OS memory. I then have net IO and block IO. So those are different things I can control. I break out of here and I start another container, this time with a four gig limit and a one CPU limit. So there we see memory for GB, one CPU. We run this code. And do a Docker PS. You can see I have both containers are up and running on unique ports. So there is three, one, four, Three four three one four three three. I should probably pick ports that like roll off the tongue a little bit easier than those two. And now, if I ask that instance, the one ending in three one four three three, what its CPU configuration is a memory configuration, it sees all of the cores, right? The scheduler is going to limit it to the one core that I told it that to access to. And as I said, you can only see four gigs of RAM. Eighty percent of that is three gigs. And so let's spin up a workload on that instance. And so that's going to run that workload in a hard loop, constantly check DB in my workload. If I do Docker stats now, we can see who's humming along and chewing up all my resources. So on SQL Demo 3D, using about 80% of my CPU, not a lot of memory yet, because I think I've checked DB is against master. So that's only a couple dozen megabytes. And so we can see who's consuming what. It's a pretty good block I.O. happening. Now, what's neat with this is in real time, so let me background this task here, clear that console. That workload is still running. This is running in the background. I can say, you know what? 3B is burning up a lot of CPU, and it's making this other instance sad, 3A, or maybe even my workstation sad. Or if this is in some semi-production environment, I can come along later and just say, you know what? I'm going to limit you. To half a core it just kind of puts you in a box and say you know what you now have access to only half a core so when i go over here we see very quickly it went from 70 80 to fit to tapping out at 50 right which i think is pretty cool to be able to assert that control real time if it wanted to go even further just for kind of demonstration purposes down to a tenth of a core now i'm down to 10 percent. so real time i can make these changes and kind of like put that workload into uh get that workload under control. So let's jump back out of here. And I do want to point out that this time I'm running PS minus AUX, not inside the container, but outside the container, right? So this is in my base OS Docker zero. And what we see here, and this is, we talked about how container D actually starts up these containers. So even though I'm running Docker commands all day, it talks to container D and just starts up the containers. Container D, is the container runtime, which has the responsibility of starting up our SQL Server, and there we see our SQL Server processes, right? For SQL Server and Linux, there's always going to be two, so there we see the two processes. Now, the key concept I want to point out here is these are just processes running on the base OS. So from a monitoring standpoint, I can just monitor the underlying OS to extract those performance metrics out, and I can use some metadata that I can extract from Docker to determine which process is which in my monitoring platform if I need to do that. So with that, let's go ahead and kill off the two containers to keep my laptop fans from going crazy. Cool, let's jump back into Keynote and wrap it up. And so there we defined some uh, limits. We then used or looked at how SQL Server sees the underlying host hardware from a memory standpoint and a CPU standpoint. Remember, SQL Server will always see all of the CPUs. In my uh, demo system here, I had only two and always saw all two CPUs, regardless of the CPU limits that I asserted on a system, but that's not true for memory. Memory will only see what it has exposed to the container from a limit standpoint, and we used the Docker stats to examine some performance data. So we covered a whole boatload of stuff, uh, 18 minutes over, um, but we looked at storing persistent data in containers, using non-root containers and why that's super important, building a container image with some features and configurations and kind of bringing together that non-root concept into uh, practice, building that container image securely, and then getting container data, getting databases into your containers, both manually, 
uh, from a Docker data volume. Also automatically from a scripting standpoint, and talked about some other techniques too, with DBA tools and PowerShell and so on. Um, you could also, obviously, if you're building a CI pipeline, you could do something like um, have that as part of a build step that comes along later to inject your uh, data. And then some container performance concepts. Uh, in the next few minutes, if not tonight, maybe first thing in the morning, I'll PDF the decks and put all the code on GitHub for you all to have. And this is still my contact information at the bottom. So I open it up for questions if there are any, Kevin. So let's see if there are any questions. Uh, one of them actually was around whether or not the slides and such would be available. So already answered that. Um, containers are their own art form, which is a good way of phrasing True. that. Uh, maybe this container thing could be used to create experiments with various resource constraints. Yeah, definitely. I could see that. If you want to test how the performance profile of an application, uh, definitely could use it to kind of you know, finesse it to that scenario. Your, those, yeah. your resource constraints. And if there are any more questions, folks, get them in. Uh, looks like if SQL Server always sees all CPUs, would it make sense to set CPU affinity to have some control over that? Well, that's what limits. Mm -hmm. So I think you're talking about the SQL Server affinity inside of the um, SQL Server uh, configuration. Um, you know what? I had intended to follow up with the product group on this on guidance because this number of OS schedulers exposed will be six or two in my demo lab. Um, let me follow up with that. And in fact, I'm literally going to take a note because I had intended okay. to do that um, previously. Where is that? So OS schedulers. My advanced note taking technique. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get back to that tomorrow morning, like, what the heck did I mean? Yeah. No, I um no, I developed a pretty good relationship with the PG around a lot of these topics. Um and so I'll i shoot them an email tonight and say, Hey, what's the like the actual performance guidance on that? Because um that's definitely something to consider. Yeah, for sure. Uh, recovery within a container. If the process drops, would the data be recoverable if the logs are on a host volume? So as long as, so we're using Docker data volumes. Um, there is another type of volume called a volume mount, I think it is. I forget. I almost always use Docker data volumes um, because then the underlying container runtime manages where that data physically lives unless you override the parameter where it lives. Uh, the, re the reason I'm saying it is if I come back and just say, you know what, use SQL data one, my data is going to be there. If my data is not there for whatever reason, someone deleted a log file, then I have to recover that data like I would any other database, regardless of if it's in container or not. I think I answered that correctly or I understood the question correctly. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. So still interested in where these Docker data volumes sit. Sure. All right. So we did um, this. Go back to here and run. This is the very, very, very first container that we ran. It just had a data volume attached to it. So nothing special yet. And what I did was you know, the, the volume SQL data one. So when I run this command, what I'm asking Docker to do is to create dynamically create a Docker data volume. I can actually do a Docker volume create and create that volume like right now, right? SQL data one. And what that will do is create a data volume in the default data location of the base OS. But what I'm doing here is I'm doing that with, hold on, I'm just getting tied up in command line foo here. What I'm doing here is say, you know, just Docker, just create this in your default data location and attach it here. And let's talk about where that default location is. That's what this command does. Docker volume inspect LS SQL data one shows me exactly on the base operating system where that data physically is. And so all the container runtime is doing is taking this volume 
at this location, right, this one right here, and mounting it into the container at this location. It's like, if I, I wish I had like a whiteboard. Um, kind of imagine it as literally just kind of plugging it in at that file system location bar up MSSQL, right? And so the process that's running on the base OS, like we saw earlier um, down here, was it's just a process. And the container runtime is the one that manages. You know what? You're writing a bar up MSSQL master.mdf. It's really going to be here inside of this location. And so if I go and run this command, we'll see where it really, really lives, right? Master.mdf. Uh, and so anytime the container running writes to var up the SSQL master.mdf, if the container runtime is really just saying, you know what, write it over here in this location. And so that's where they really live. Right, and that location can be a uh, any sort of mount point. So it could be physical drive, direct attached storage. It could be a SAN. Uh, it could be a mount point derived from like AWS or Azure blob storage. Yeah, and that's where this driver comes in. So you would need the driver to do that, um, to say, you know what, use this. But that's what I talked about during the presentation is rather than using a driver, generally what I, I, I do is if I'm going to attach a remote fiber channel like disk, I'll just attach that remote fiber channel disk in, in this OS here rather than have Docker manage that for me, right? And then it, and I can consume that resource. If this is the Azure VM, same concept. I would just attach a disk to the, to the base OS and then just consume that as a local resource, right? Makes sense. Yeah, honestly, oh, I haven't seen. A, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of. Well, and you're removing a dependency. I'm not, I'm not relying on Docker to build good uh, drivers for this. I'm relying on Linux, the base OS. To you know what? I can attach a Fiber Channel one. No big deal, right? I can attach uh, a block device that's an Azure Disk VM or, or an Azure Disk or an EBS Disk, right? Um, and so I, I kind of put that. Um, complexity into something that I know better. I, I'm not going to lie. I've reached in full transparency. I have never seen anyone use a driver. And I, when I built this presentation last year, I researched the heck out of this to see if there's even any activity occurring around driver development. And I found zero. So if anybody has seen that, please let me know. They might be looking in the wrong places. Yeah, I can say I have not either. Yeah. Because it just makes sense. Just push that complexity into the base OS, you know, and just leave it there. Right. Yeah. But I can see like automation, you might, you know, one dynamic they allocate it, yada, yada, but it's not something I've come across. All right. Looks like we have uh, successfully seen all of chat's brains collectively explode. Hey, look what that happens. Oh. <laughs> You've done well, Anthony. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry for going over. It's been the, I was talking with Kevin earlier before the presentation. It's been um, a while since I've presented, and so um, I just got a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, no worries. We absolutely appreciate you taking the time, especially since we got you on short notice and uh, going through this. I think I would... I would say, if I could speak for chat, that this was outstanding. Thank you. Thank and you. I'm speaking for chat because they've also already said this was outstanding. So uh, thank you again so much. And for anybody whose brain did explode and wants to go back again later on, um, we will have a recording of this posted on the uh, YouTube channel probably by tomorrow sometime. Cool, cool. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you having me. If there's any questions, please feel free to reach out. And like I said, probably not tonight because, well, it's getting a little late, but I'll definitely get this on uh, early in the AM tomorrow at my GitHub repo there. Very good. Thank you very much. And until next time, everybody, we will talk to you later. Uh, next Tuesday, Rick Pack will be hosting our data science group. So,
check out his presentation. It's already posted on our meetup, meetup.com slash tripass, T-R-I-P-A-S-S. And until next time, everyone, take care. Cool. Thank you.